Hello everybody and welcome to Flock Talk. Today we are going to be making three easy and affordable Christmas ornaments. You good up there? Okay. All of these ornaments are going to be featuring our birds of course, but they are also going to be made with materials that you either already have at home or can easily find cheaply at the dollar store. So we have a lot of work to do, so let's get going. All right, so the first one we're gonna start off with is called salt dough. And we're gonna make this slightly differently just to make sure that it can pick up lightweight little birdie feet. So what we're gonna use is a quarter cup of salt, a full cup of whatever flour you have, just make sure it is not self-raising flour, but anything else will work just fine. And then you're going to want two thirds of a cup of water. I know I only have a third in that measuring cup there. I ended up adding more later you need two thirds of a cup of water. Mixing it together is super, super easy. You're just gonna throw it all into the same bowl at once and mix it together. You could use a spoon. I chose to use my hand. And you're just gonna go until everything has pulled together. It's going to be quite soft and quite sticky when you are handling it. That is okay. Uh, we're gonna be fixing that in a second. So what we're gonna do next is take a little bit of extra flour and sprinkle that onto a clean countertop. And we're going to very lightly knead the dough onto that floured surface. What this is gonna do is A, take away some of that extra stickiness by adding an extra little bit of flour into the dough while still keeping it soft and malleable for tiny little bird feet. And it's also gonna activate the gluten in the dough. Now you do not want to keep adding a ton of flour onto this surface. What's gonna happen if you do that is it's going to make the dough super, super firm and then it's not gonna be able to pick up tiny lightweight birdie feet. You want to knead the dough until it is tacky but no longer sticky. Traditionally when you make this dough yes you go until it's totally smooth and it's not going to stick to your hands or anything but because we want to make this soft enough to be able to work on really lightweight tiny birds we need to make it a little bit tackier. It shouldn't outright be sticky. When I touch it from my hand you can see that it isn't leaving any residue or anything behind but it will still make that kind of sticky sound effect when you're handling it. And that's the sound that you are looking for. Once you have your dough made, you can test it out and decide whether or not it's going to work with your bird by lightly tapping it with your finger or putting something of a similar weight on top of it and just seeing how it picks up. If you have done this and it is too firm, you can put it back into a mixing bowl, add a little bit of water and keep kneading it to soften it a bit more. Or if you find that it's still too soft, you can add a little bit of flour and just kind of adjust as need be for your weight of bird. Once you are satisfied with the density of your dough, you're just going to roll it out onto your floured surface. Now it doesn't necessarily matter how thin or thick you roll it out, but do keep in mind that we're gonna be leaving this to air dry and it needs to dry rock solid. So keep in mind, if you make this super duper thick, it could take a week, it could take two weeks for it to dry if you make it crazy, crazy thick. So what I'm opting to do is make it quite thin. This is probably like a quarter of a centimeter. It is about the same thickness of like your phone charging cable. So it's quite thin, but still thick enough that it's going to be sturdy when it dries hard. You don't want to do it so thin that it's see-through because then your bird's nails are going to dig right through it and break the dough and your ornament when it's hardened and dried will be really, really fragile. So you're just aiming for a thickness that you are happy to wait for the drying time for, but is still going to be durable once it is hardened. Once you are satisfied with the thickness of your dough and the density of it, we can go ahead and get started on the next part. So what you would typically do is you would get your dog to give you their paw and then you would manually squish that paw into the dough. Now, obviously we can't easily do it that way with birds. A, their toes are just super, super delicate and B, they often don't like having their feet handled. So what I'm gonna do instead is have my dough rolled out. I'm gonna clean up the area around it so my birds aren't dragging their tails through a bunch of raw flour. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use a treat and I'm going to lure them across the dough. If your bird is super uncomfortable, I would just spend some time walking around the dough or moving the dough onto a surface that they're more comfortable walking on. These guys have done quite a few videos on this kitchen countertop here, so they're quite fine walking along this. 
but you may want to move it onto a cutting board or something and then that way you can move it into a room they're more comfortable with you may have more success that way your goal here is to help them feel comfortable there's no point doing a craft that's just going to stress them out and cause them to be panicked so please don't rush this and horrify them just for the sake of getting a footprint that's not the memory you want to remember and capture. So once you've built up some comfort, you can use your treats and you can gently lure the bird across. And what this is going to do is it's going to leave some very, very faint footprints. And now you can leave them like this if you want to. If you're happy with the more subtle indentations, but you get that genuine texture of their little footy prints, you can absolutely leave it that way. There are also a few things you can do to help get a bit of a deeper indentation. And it's going to be a little bit of experimentation on your part. So a couple things I found helped was I got my bird to walk onto the dough and then I would conceal the treat inside my fingertips a little bit so they really had to fight and dig between my fingers in order to get the treat out from between them. And what that did is it caused the bird to press their feet down into that dough deeper and grip in since they're using a lot of that momentum and that grip to be able to thrust their beak deeper in between my fingers and that allows those prints to get in a little bit deeper. Sometimes what also helps is actually when they are grabbing the treat from your fingers to almost push down a little bit. No, you're not pushing hard but you're just kind of shrinking their neck down over their shoulder blades a little bit and that can cause them to kind of sink down into the dough a little bit more as opposed to just having them sprint straight across where they might be taking really quick light steps and you might not have them nicely sink into the dough and get clear footprints. But it's going to be a bit of experimenting and seeing what works. Um, a key thing to note here is that there's no rush. You can re-knead this dough as many times as you need to. You can re-roll it out as many times as you need to. It doesn't dry super quickly and it's not going to cause any problems. We're not baking it so it's not going to cause any change in how it's going to dry. If you have your bird run across this 700 times and the prints don't come out, you can just knead it back up, roll it back out again, and try again. There's no big deal. So please don't get super worked up if it doesn't work out the first time. You can retry as many times as necessary. So once you have had them walk across this and you've got a couple footprints that are cute the way you want them to look, maybe you've got a cute little pair, whatever you are happy with, all we're going to do next is take a little cookie cutter or you could use a butter knife and just cut around it. We're simply going to cut out the footprints that we're happy with. I had some cookie cutters, you could also use a mug, you can use whatever you have on hand to cut around the footprints that you do want to preserve. And you can do this at any point if you find that you want to re-roll your dough a couple different times, you can cut out a couple prints that were the best from that batch and set them aside and then re-roll the rest of the dough. You can really pick and choose and do this as many times as necessary until you get it right, which I really, really, really love because I'm super picky when it comes to things like this. Once we have our footprints selected, I am turning these into ornaments. So what I need to do is take a straw, or if you don't have one, you could just as easily cut a little hole in the top with a knife or whatever else you have on hand, and I'm just gonna cut a little hole. I'm gonna stab the straw into the top of it just to make a spot for a string to go through so we could hang this up. If you just want this as a paperweight, you totally don't have to do it. Make it however you want, but I'm planning on hanging them up, so I'm adding a little hole. Now from here, you could leave them like this, but the indentations are really, really faint. Um, you could probably paint around it or add glitter around it to help accentuate the natural indentations of the bird's foot already. But I personally want these to be more visible from a distance, so what I'm going to choose to do is I'm going to actually indent it a little bit deeper myself. So I have a fondant molding tool and I'm just going to use it to press in the existing shape of the foot that the bird has already made. You don't need a fondant molding tool, you could just use the back end of a spoon or something and it would work just the same. I just had this so I figured I would use it. Um, and this is just to make it a little bit more visible from a distance. Again, not a step you have to do. If you want to leave the more subtle indentation but have their genuine foot texture, you can leave it that way. I just personally wanted it a little deeper and a little more obvious, so I decided to take this step, but it's not totally necessary. So once I have my feet all shaped up and I've got those holes in the top and I'm pretty happy with how it's looking, I decided to add some feathers to mine. These are not going to be going in the oven, so if you want to add little memorabilia pieces of your bird, you absolutely can. These are just going to be left out in the air to dry, so you don't need to worry about them needing to withstand heat. All I'm doing is picking out some feathers that I think are 
really telling of my birds and I'm just gonna delicately slide it into the bottom of the ornament create a little bit of decoration make it a little bit more obvious whose footprints are whose and just have a little bit more fun with it make it a little bit more unique again you don't have to but I wanted to so I did you don't have to add any glue or anything these are just going to slide in place and then as they dry they'll actually hold themselves in there at this point you can pretty much call the base of these done. We're going to leave these out to dry with the foot side facing up for about 24 hours. Once that top is totally dry, you'll be able to tell because it will have gotten super, super light and you can tap your fingernail on the top and it'll be firm and solid. You shouldn't be able to squish your fingernail into it. Once it's at that point, you can flip all the ornaments upside down and now let the air hit the back side of it and dry out from the other side as well. Same thing, you're gonna wait another 24 hours and if these are thin enough, they will be totally dry. If they are not dry, you will be able to easily tell. And you can see how the color in the middle of the ornament is way darker and shinier than the outside rim, which has dried. So that's a pretty telling sign that it isn't dried yet. Again, you can also tell by indenting it with your fingernail. If it is solid, it should not be able to be dented with your fingernail and it should be a solid hollow sound when you tap on it. Once the ornaments are totally dry, we can refine them a little bit. So some of mine you can see have some edges that are a little bit rougher. So what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of sandpaper and I'm just going to sand down the sides just to make them a little bit smoother. This is just aesthetic. It makes me happy if it's a little bit smoother. So that's what I'm choosing to do here. Once they have been sanded down and they're smooth and I'm happy with the way that they look, we can go ahead and seal these. And this coating is just so that way they aren't gonna get moisture on them and suddenly rehydrate and become squishy again. And this is gonna make sure that they're able to stand up to the elements and not get damaged. And this is also our opportunity to decorate them. So I'm going to use Mod Podge to seal and protect these ornaments. One really important thing when you are putting Mod Podge on these is as soon as moisture touches the surface of this, it's going to begin to rehydrate the dough. And so you do need to work quickly and you need to work in pretty thin layers. If you move super, super slowly when coating over the footprint, you're going to end up softening it. And then your brush strokes as they go over it are going to get rid of some of that texture, potentially warp the footprint. So you want to make sure that you're moving quickly, that you're not waiting until the Mod Podge is almost getting tacky by the time you're done, and that your coats are pretty thin. If you put a super thick coat on, you're going to run the risk of this drying super, super cloudy. And you also might risk losing some of that foot texture that you got from the original imprint, because that thickness is going to fill it in and potentially stay cloudy. So keep your coats thin and keep them really, really quick and that's going to give you the best results. We're going to repeat this process for both sides. Don't forget to also get around the edges as well as inside that hole if you are planning on turning these into ornaments. You don't want any surface of this to be left exposed to the elements where it could end up getting moisture or damage over time. Mod Podge dries pretty quickly, so after about 20 minutes I can flip it, do the other side, flip it back. You can do as many coats as you want to feel safe. Um, because I'm adding a ton of decorations into mine, I just did one base coat and then I'm going to start decorating. So once that first coat is fully, fully dried, I decided to use glitter. So how I opted to go about mine was I put a little bit more Mod Podge wherever I wanted the glitter to go. So I've got some where I put Mod Podge in the footprint itself, and then I sprinkled glitter on top, and then very carefully used a toothpick to kind of move the glitter around, get it more precisely in those footprints, and just help it kind of shimmer and accentuate the print on my little dough ornament. Then there's others where I left the footprint totally clear, but I put the Mod Podge everywhere except the footprint, and then sprinkle the glitter on top, let that all dry. And then there's some that I left totally plain, but I decided to put glitter all over the back. You can have 100% clear, fun, free agency with whatever you want in here. If you have Sharpies and you want to just color it in with Sharpie, go right ahead. If you have some paints laying around and you want to decorate it more, go right ahead. If you want to write their name on the back so you know whose prints are whose, or you want to write the date or their birth date, you can do whatever you want <laughs> to decorate this and have fun. Just please keep basic bird safety in mind. If you are using something that has fumes, make sure it's well ventilated, make sure your birds aren't around, and all of that 
good stuff. If you are working with glitter, what I will say is make sure you put down your glue first, then sprinkle your glitter on top. Once that has dried and there's no excess glitter able to be knocked off, go back over it again with another layer of Mod Podge. This is gonna help seal in the glitter a little better and also create a nice smooth surface. When you go over the glitter the second time with the Mod Podge, you can do it a little bit thicker and let it kind of soak in between all those granules to create a smooth surface that's even. So that way when it's getting packaged away or going into storage, those bits of glitter aren't gonna get caught on anything and get pulled off. This way they're gonna be nice and sealed in and have a smooth top. Now with the feathers, feathers will get damaged when you are putting them into storage and you can seal feathers. You can make them more durable, you can put a coating on them and you can do this with Mod Podge. One thing I will say is that it's not gonna work for every single feather that you put it on. So I would do it on a test feather first, get your strategy figured out before putting it on the one that you actually want on your ornament. So a couple key notes here is always go with the grain of the feather and do it in super thin coats. If you apply the Mod Podge thickly onto your feather, it's going to end up looking like a plastered wet feather and then it's gonna dry like a plastered wet feather and it's not gonna be pretty and fluffy and the way that you're really wanting it to look. So you wanna make sure that you are applying your Mod Podge with the grain of the feather and that you are wiping off any excess either with a clean brush or maybe with a paper towel. You just wanna make sure that you're having the feather with the coating on it still looking like a dry feather. Otherwise, it will not dry, looking like a dry feather. <laughs> Once you get that first coat on, then it becomes a lot easier because now all of the feather filaments are held in place. So now when you do your second or third coat or how many you want to do, it's not going to end up looking like a wet plastered feather because you already have those filaments stuck in place and they can't easily move into that wet feather plastered kind of look. Another thing that can cause your feather to end up looking immediately plastered is if you soak both sides of the feather at once. So please make sure that you are only doing the top, letting that fully dry before flipping it over and doing the back side. It can be really tempting to do it quickly, but when you add both sides at once, it weighs down the feather too much and you end up with that wet plastered gross feather look. If you do mess up and you end up with a wet plastered feather and you hate it and you're super upset because it ruined the whole thing, don't worry you can just pull it out. <laughs> because we didn't put any glue in these feathers, although they're quite durable and they'll hold it in place, they're just held in by pressure. So all you can do is just very carefully hold it with your fingers and just smoothly pull it out. You can put a new feather in there. Feathers are very, very consistent in their shape. So as long as you have another feather that's pretty similar to the one that was in there in the first place, you can pretty easily just put a new one in there. You don't have to drill a new hole. You don't have to do anything crazy like that. You can just slide another feather in and you can leave it uncoated if you want, if you're afraid of messing it up again. It's easy to fix. It's not a big deal. It's all good. When you do put in a new replacement feather though, I would dip the end of it into a little bit of glue or into the Mod Podge before putting it into the hole. But once we're all done here, it's all decorated the way that we want. We're happy with everything. We're gonna go ahead and take a little piece of ribbon and thread it through the hole. If you have a hole that's too small and your ribbon won't fit, you can usually just curl the end of the ribbon like a taco and be able to squeeze it in. If that's still giving you a hard time, you can lay the ribbon over the opening and use a toothpick to poke it through. Or you might wanna ask around and see if somebody has a large sewing needle um, that would fit the thickness of your ribbon and you might be able to thread it through that way. We're just gonna tie it into a nice little bow, making sure to leave a loop at the bottom so that way it can hang off of the Christmas tree or wherever we're planning on putting it. Tidy up the ends of our ribbon, make sure that it looks all pretty and nice and we're happy with the way that it looks. And then that's them, they're all good and done. The great thing about this one is it's, it's a craft. You don't have to follow just the way I've done it. You can have as much fun as you want. You can use whatever supplies you have on hand. If you don't have ribbon, but you still want to hang it, you can just as easily use like string for cooking. You could probably find a bird toy that doesn't need its string anymore and you could use that. Um, you can also actually make paper cording or just cut a strip of paper and use that. There's all sorts of things you can use to modify this and make it however you want. 
and make it how whichever way is going to make you happy. This one's definitely one of my absolute favorite ones because you really capture the texture of their feet and it's just so like permanently in there. These are super super durable and they're going to last a very long time. But now let's hop off to the next one. This one is going to be another great one if you have a bird that's a bit more nervous about walking on scary things. This is going to involve some clear plastic ornaments which you can usually find at a dollar store for one to three dollars depending on the location. You're going to need some of your bird's feathers, as many as you have got, and then I've also got some glitter here that's going to look a bit like frost as well as some clear glue and our best friend Mr. Ribbon again. And this one is probably going to be our quickest and easiest ornament of the day. So the first thing we're going to do is take the lids off of our little clear ornaments here. And they usually just pull straight off. There's two little metal prongs that will squeeze in as you pull it up. They should come off really easily. So what I'm going to do is since the ornament here is going to be filled with feathers, those feathers are actually going to want to sink at the bottom. So any decoration I want to put in this ornament, I want to make sure is mostly on the top half of this ornament, just to make sure that the feathers are still going to be visible. So I'm going to take my clear glue and I'm just going to put it in the bottle and squeeze it for about the top third or so of the ornament. You do want to be careful not to put too much glue in here. I was super impatient. So I put a ton of glue in the top just so that way it would slide around a little easier as I am rotating the ball around to try and get the glue to spread and touch all of these surfaces on that top third of the ornament. Um, but because I was so impatient, this layer was super, super thick. Uh, which means it's going to take a long time to dry and also that there's going to be a lot of excess that wants to fall around later. So I do recommend putting a much thinner layer of glue than what I did here, um, but it did still turn out. Um, but once you've got the glue in place and it's covering the top third of the ornament, I'm going to go ahead and fill the orb with glitter. It doesn't really matter if it falls to the bottom because the glitter is only going to stick to where the glue is. So you can put as much glitter as you want in there and just shake it around to make sure it touches every single surface that has the glue. Once it's fully coated and touching all the glue and you're happy with the way that it looks, you can dump the excess glitter out or add more as needed. If you do this and you're like, oh, I wish there was a little bit more glitter here, you can go ahead and add random little globs of glue to the bottom if you want. You can add a couple little dots here and there. And I do find it gives it a bit more of a kind of frosty effect if you add a couple random dots on the lower half of the ornament. Um, and again, same thing, you would put a couple random dots, shake your glitter all around, and just make sure it coats everything. Once you're done and you're kind of happy with the way that that's looking, you're going to want to make sure that you leave this to dry upside down. So that way that open hole at the top is going to allow any extra glue to drip down and out of the ornament. If you leave this on its side or on its base or whatever, all of the extra glue that's in there is going to slowly sink towards that spot. And that could end up ruining the ornament for you if it ends up forming a super huge clump in a spot that you don't like. Um, but by leaving them upside down, we already want the entire top half of the ornament to be mostly glitter anyways. So anything that runs is going to be going in the direction we want it to go. And any excess is just going to fall out the top and land on top of a clean towel or a paper towel or whatever you've got up there. One thing I will say is while you are leaving these to dry, make sure to check on them every 10 minutes or so, because as the glue kind of runs and shifts as it dries, you might find that some areas end up losing uh, a layer of glitter and you might need to add a little bit more glitter in there and shake it up again, just to make sure that it's all gonna be as coated as you want it to. So just keep an eye on it, make sure it's drying the way you want it to and that you don't just leave it and then come back to an ornament with half of its glitter that has run out of it because you added too much glue, but maybe that's just a me problem. Once these are fully, fully dried, and being fully dry, again, is really important <laughs> as much as we don't want to wait, um, we can go ahead and start adding in our feathers. If you don't wait until it's fully bone dry and you try to add feathers in while it's still kind of tacky, you're going to end up wrecking a lot of your feathers. Your feathers are going to get stuck to the glue on the inside. You're going to have to get tweezers to try and fix this. Yes, I am speaking from experience. Yes, I did try and rush this. You do need to wait for it to fully dry. And then once it's dry, it'll be really easy because you can just pick out whatever feathers you want and pop it in. So while I wait for it to dry, I'm going to go through my feathers and I'm going to kind of organize which ones I want. I'm going to hold them up to the ornament as well. 
just to make sure they're going to fit. If you have a feather that's kind of longer than the widest part of your ornament, it's not going to fit in very nicely or it's going to look a little awkward. Um, so I would just hold them up. For some of them, if they're a bit long, you might want to cut the calamus off the base of your feather there. Just that way it fits in nicely and you still get the full effect of the fluffy flowy feather. I'm going to pick out ones that have kind of all the colors of each of my birds. So for Toto, I'm wanting to make sure I get his blues and I get his bright yellows and I get some of that gray on his belly as well as the green. Getting some flight feathers, some tail feathers, kind of picking out everything that I think is going to most visually represent him inside the orb and whatever feathers I would be happy to see inside the orb that I think are going to look nice. And then for Newt, same thing. I'm going to pick out some of that bright red tail, some of his more beige chest. Got to get those maroon belly, maroon bellied conure feathers in there, uh, as well as some wing feathers and those bright, bright blues. Once you're happy with your feather selection and your ornament is completely dry, you can very simply take those feathers and pop them in. It is easiest to thread them in if you put them in calamus first, the, the part of the feather that would be in your bird's skin. Um, that will move with the filaments of the feather, so you're not going to put a feather in there tip first, have it brush against the grain, and then have your feather looking real tattered and messy when it makes it in there. I chose to put mine in in a very scattered order because I wanted to make sure that they layered nicely. If you put all of your biggest ones in first, you might have some difficulty getting your smaller feathers in there. So I kind of did one big one, a bunch of small ones, some medium ones, and then put another big one in because you don't want to block off your entryway with all of your giant feathers and then you're having a hard time getting the rest of them in there. And you're kind of just eyeballing it. I put a bunch of mine in and would just keep taking a look at the orb until I was happy with the way that it looked, adding more as needed. Now the way I did Toto's, it came out very, very clear on the bottom so you can see a lot of feathers, whereas with Newt's I had a lot more of the glue running, and so it came out a lot more frosty looking, which does make the feathers a little harder to see, but gives it a much more like wintry feel, so I kind of really like the way that it it turned out. Another thing I did was I added in some loose glitter as well because what's going to happen is those feathers, the filaments have tiny little microscopic hooks on them so they're actually going to grip on to some of those tiny particles of glitter and it's going to give the feathers a bit more of a kind of wintry glistening shine to them while they're bouncing around inside the ball and it just kind of gives a bit more movement to the ornament because some of those bigger feathers will be stuck against the walls and they won't want to move around but having that loose glitter can create a bit more of kind of a snow globe effect, I suppose, and just add a bit more visual effect to the ornament itself. Toto's ornament ended up coming out way more clear, so it's a lot easier to see a bunch of the feathers. Whereas with Newt's, I had the excess glue problem, so I had a lot more of the glue running around and it came out a lot more kind of foggy looking almost. And it makes the feathers harder to see, but I do like the effect that it gave it. So it's kind of a different look that I wasn't necessarily going for but I'm, I'm really quite happy with the way that it came out and it made it super super sparkly, super glittery, very Christmassy, very winter vibes so I'm pretty pleased with the way that these two came out. All right this last one is going to be the messiest one that we do and when I say please make sure to cover every surface that you care about with paper towel and wear clothes that you do not care if they get permanently stained, I am very serious. I do not care how much you think you will be able to keep things clean. Dye is going to be going onto a bird's feet, and if you don't think that bird is gonna take off with sopping wet feet and flick dye everywhere, you are sorely mistaken. We're going to be using food coloring to dye our bird's tootsies and have them walk across a piece of paper or a surface of your choice in order to get their footprints. And you can use basically whatever food coloring you have. Do please double check the brands of whichever ones you have just to triple check that they are safe for your bird. This does mean that residue will be left behind on your bird's feet. We are going to make sure to clean them up so they won't have like dripping excessive amounts of dye on them, but it will lightly stain the bottoms of their toes for... my guys were only stained for about a day or two. Um, but if they preen their toes in that time, you do want to double check that it's obviously not going to hurt them. Okay, so to get started with this, we're going to pick out a food coloring color that we want our little footy prints to be. I ended up choosing black, and I would recommend choosing a dark, rich color. If you choose a pastel or a light tone, we do have to dilute this in water. So it's probably not going to end up showing up the way that you want it to 
when you're trying to get your prints, I really do recommend going with something dark. It'll end up coming out way lighter than you think it's going to. So what we're gonna do is you're going to take a little bit of warm water. You don't wanna use cold. It'll take you a really long time to disperse the pigment into the water. Um, if you use warm water, it becomes really, really easy for your food coloring to mix in with that water and distribute evenly, and it'll just make this process a lot easier for you uh, if you do it that way. So we're gonna take a little bit of warm water, we're going to pour it into our little mixing dish, and then we're going to add in our food coloring into that water. From here, I would grab a piece of paper and I would do some little testers. Just dip your finger or your toothpick into the water and then lightly tap it onto your piece of paper and see what it looks like. Because you're going to end up using a lot more food coloring than you think you need in order to get a nice dark print out of this. And you can do these little tests. It'll make it nice and easy for you to see how dark it's going to be. And you're not going to be stressing your bird out, having them need to do this for six hours while you try and get the exact dilution of your pigment figured out. So you're just going to put some of your food coloring in the water, test it out. If you don't like how light it is, add a bit more. And just keep repeating that process until you are able to dip your finger onto the piece of paper and be happy with the way that it dries down. Once you're satisfied with that, you can go ahead and you can transfer your dye into a shallow plate. Please pick a plate that is not longer than your bird is from feet to tail. You really don't want to have a super large serving tray for this and then have your bird accidentally dragging their tail through food coloring. So I would definitely make sure to use a plate that is shallow but does have a bit of a lip to hold their tail up onto or is not long enough for them to end up dragging their tail in it when they run from one side to the next. So once I'm all set up with my colorings, I'm going to teach my birds how to run across this plate. And that sounds a little funny, why would you have to teach that? But a lot of birds will either be confused because they haven't had to run across a plate before, or they'll be tempted just to stay on the edges because they know they can reach the middle, they don't need to step in the middle, it's kind of a weird thing for them to do. So I wanna make sure that my bird is confident running across the plate first before I introduce the dye. So I'm gonna take a clean, empty plate here, and I'm just going to use a treat lure and guide my bird across it. I'll reward them just for leaning, I'll reward them for putting one foot on the middle, and then gradually work up to them being able to put two feet on until they're confidently running across it and not doing that ring around the rosy, hesitant thing like they were doing at the beginning. Newt had absolutely no problem with this. He was Speedy Gonzalez zooming to the other end of this thing immediately, which is brilliant and perfect. Um, Toto, on the other hand, was quite hesitant, so he took a little bit more time to get comfortable with it. Um, but he did get there in the end. So just take your time with it, build up some confidence. You can leave this dye out overnight as long as you're using a dish that you're not gonna care if it gets stained. You don't need to rush them to get these prints. Again, we don't wanna capture a memory of tormenting our bird to get their footprints. We want to have this print be a memory of a really good fun time we had together. So let's not rush them. Let's take the time to prepare them for it and do it as need be. So once they're confident here, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the dye. Now, just because they were confident running across the plate before does not mean they're gonna be confident running across the plate now that there is a big black hole puddle of death in the middle of this plate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to lay out my plate and I'm gonna put all of the pieces of paper that I want to get printed with their footprints all around the plate. I am gonna put this on every possible surface that I think the bird will possibly run onto just so that way I do not have little pittery pattery stained footprints running across my kitchen countertop for the rest of my life. And once I've got all of this set down where I'm pretty confident things are gonna be clean, I'm going to begin to encourage the bird to interact with it. For the first few times, I'm just going to have them walk past the dish. I'm not gonna encourage them to go in it. I just want them to acknowledge that this big scary black hole exists now decide how they feel about it, and then go from there. Newt was pretty confident here. He took a couple looks at it, like, what the heck is that? Put a foot in it, realized it wasn't gonna hurt him, and then had no issues running through. And we're just gonna use this treat to guide our bird through the puddle of black death and sprint across these little pieces of paper. And one thing I will say to keep an eye out for is once you've had them run through it once, Keep track of which feet you like. As soon as you see a footprint that you like, pull that piece of paper off of 
be bored and put a new one in its place because every time they do this they can be unpredictable you don't know if they're going to run back over top of that footprint that you really liked and now it's got six prints stomped all over top of it and you don't like it anymore so keep an eye on it take away the ones that you like just add new pieces of paper in you can use as many pieces of paper as you want and just enjoy the experience of your birds splattering their little footy prints all over the place and gather as many footprints as you want until you're happy with it. Toto was a little bit more nervous here, so I only got one good set of prints out of him, but I was at least able to get one and it was pretty stress-free, so I'm gonna be happy with that. He didn't wanna do more, I wasn't gonna push it, but we got a foot we can work with and that's okay. Now this in of itself, you could do whatever you wanted with. You could stick it into a picture frame. I'm sure there's like DIY ornaments that exist already that you can just put a picture in and you could just slide this in there and call it a day. However, I'm trying to do this without having to purchase excess things. So I'm going to take the footy prints that I like and I'm going to go ahead and cut them out. I'm going to leave a little bit of room around the edge of the footprints wide enough to fit my selected piece of ribbon because this is going to basically form our picture frame. So I want to make sure that there's enough space to accommodate that picture frame without going over top of the footprint. So I'm just going to kind of eyeball it. I'm sure you could measure if you want to be more precise, but I'm just holding the ribbon up to it, getting a feel for how wide it needs to be away from the footprint and then cutting on the outermost edge. So that way the ribbon will be able to fit in there. Once I've got them all cut out, I'm going to go ahead and cut the ribbon to size as well. So we can form a little frame around the entire foot. Once I've got my pieces cut out, I'm going to take a little bit, I'm using Mod Podge, but you could use a glue stick or whatever you happen to have. I'm going to glue down the paper and stick the ribbon to it. And I'm going to repeat this process for all four sides of the front of the little footy print picture frame here. One thing to note is that the ribbon will want to kind of soak up excess glue. So if you glue this down, make sure to put a nice thick layer where your ribbon overlaps the other pieces of ribbon. Otherwise, it's very likely that those corners are going to pop up. Not a big deal. You can always re-glue them down, but just good to know that maybe make it a little bit thicker and save yourself the time. I'm going to repeat this for both of the footprints I've got going, and then I'm just going to set them off to the side to fully dry. Now, if you look at the back of these pieces, you can see that it's just thin, plain printer paper. You could do this with a thicker cardstock and you probably wouldn't have this problem. Um, but because I'm using a thin printer paper, you can see the footprint leaking through the other side of the page. And I personally want to try and cover that up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out a blank piece of paper to the exact same size or roughly the same size as the footprint piece of paper is. And this is going to be my plain backing just to conceal the fact that it's kind of leaking through to the other side of the page. It doesn't have to be the exact same size as your other piece of paper yet. You can eyeball it. It just has to be roughly the same size. You just don't want it overhanging the width of the ribbon. Another thing I'm going to make while the main piece is drying is a little loop. Because I want this to be a Christmas ornament, I need a little loop for it to be able to have a little hook put onto it. So I'm just going to take a random little sized piece of ribbon and I'm going to fold the two ends over top of each other and that's going to form our loop. We'll put a little bit of glue just at the base where the two ends touch each other and then I would leave an object rested on top of them to compress it down while it dries unless you want to just stand there until it dries. So I'll repeat this process for both of my little footy prints, get something weighing it down, and leave them to dry. Once the little ribbon loop has dried, as has our main little picture frame, we can flip our piece over to the back side and glue our little ribbon loop onto the back of our main footprint picture frame. This is going to be nestled between our two layers of paper so that way it's held a bit more securely and isn't showing like an ugly backing where you have a bunch of loose threads hanging down the back because of the cut of the string. So this is just going to help conceal it and make it look a little bit neater. Again we'll rest something on top of it and let that dry. Now while that dries I'm going to take the ribbon and cut out another picture frame for the piece of paper that's going to be our backing. This is just to help things look a little bit prettier as well as give it a bit more of a sturdier framework. Since I'm using Mod Podge or I think any glue would probably do the same thing to glue this ribbon down, it's going to firm into a really solid piece and form a nice sturdy frame 
that's not going to have our piece of paper being really flimsy and floppy. So I'm going to repeat it on both sides just to make sure that it's more durable and able to hold its shape. Now you could decorate the back if you wanted to. You could do whatever the heck you want with it. You could use a colored piece of paper. You could use a piece of fabric. You could use a piece of thin wood maybe, a piece of cardboard if you wanted it to be more sturdy. I've decided I haven't had enough glitter in my life yet today. So I used the Mod Podge again to glue down that entire piece of paper with a really thin coat, poured some glitter on top, and then gently used my finger to push it around and coat the entire piece of paper. I ended up finding that this is really helpful because the Mod Podge and glitter combo created a really stiff backing that made this ornament even more durable than if I had just done a piece of paper. Um, but that also just kind of livened up the back a little bit. So now it doesn't look like a plain unfinished backing. You could also write your bird's name, their birth date, maybe the year that you made this ornament together. You could even probably print out like a picture of your bird's face and glue that onto the back here. Those could all be really cute options of things to do here if you don't want to cover your house with glitter. As we did with our first ornament, once that first round of the glitter is dried, I'm gonna go back over it again with a much thicker coat of the Mod Podge just to seal in that glitter, make sure nothing's gonna fall off and create a super smooth backing so that glitter isn't gonna get caught and yanked off by anything. It's gonna be one consistent smooth surface where everything is fully glued down. Leave that to dry for about 20 minutes. And once it's done, we can finally attach this onto the rest of our piece. We're gonna stick it onto the back side of our existing ornament. And at the same time, I'm also going to glue on the ribbon that we're using as the frame for the back as well. This is the one part you'll want to be a little bit nitpicky on. You really want to make sure that you're lining up that ribbon uh, with the one that's on the front as well so it's not overhanging. You just want to make sure that they're nice and straight and symmetrical with the ones that are already on the front so that way when you're looking at it from the front you're not seeing the ribbon from the back sticking out or being crooked. You just want it to line up nicely so it forms one nice cohesive piece. I also decided to leave my ribbon overhanging the existing paper a little bit on both sides. That way I'm able to seal the front ribbon to the back ribbon. And what that's gonna do is create a nice shut side where you're not looking at it from the side and seeing a ribbon, a piece of paper and a ribbon. Instead, it's just the two pieces of ribbon that are stuck to each other and it just makes it look a little bit cleaner. Once again, we will leave that to dry for about 10 to 20 minutes until everything is solid. And then that's it. That That's the whole thing. We have accomplished our third and final ornament. I really like this one because it really shows the actual texture of the foot and you have the memory of them splattering their little footy prints across there. This does absolutely stain you and it stains the heck out of my fingers, but it is a lot of fun and I think it came out super cute. Um, but I will say throughout this entire craft, my birds came out the cleanest out of anything in my house. I had their dyed footy prints all over my fingers. I ended up finding later that when they moved up to my shoulder, I have footprints dyed into the shoulder of my shirt now which is kind of cute. I'm not even going to lie about it. Um, meanwhile, the birds just had a very faint amount of staining onto the bottom of their feet. And that lasted for about two days. And that was it. It was done. They weren't bothered by it. They didn't really notice it. They didn't care. They got absolutely nothing on their feathers. So it worked out really well for us. Overall, I'm really happy with the way all of these come out. This is something I've been meaning to do for a number of years now, and I just never did it. And I'm really glad that I finally did. And now I permanently have their little footprints and some of their feathers in a format that's never really going to go away or, or break down. This is going to be something that I can keep with me forever now and is always going to be a memory of them. And I think they all came out super cute in their own different ways. And I really, really, I'm, I'm really happy with the way it came out. And that is all that I have for you today. So I really hope that you guys enjoy making these ornaments or perhaps use these ideas to make a new unique craft all on your own. If you do decide to make some of these things, I would really love to see them if you want to take me in your post. It really makes my day when I get to see your guys' content. But that'll do it for me here today. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Bye! Are we being noisy? Yeah? We talking over me while I talk? Yeah, sounds about right, huh? Yeah.